So how do you make space for creativity in an already jam-packed, busy life? It can seem daunting, especially if you have other bonus challenges like being neurodivergent or chronically ill. But fortunately, we have Sandra Taylor, who's literally written the book on restructuring your life to support your creativity. What do you think are the core problems we face as creative multitaskers with busy lives? Overscheduling is almost certainly, especially if you have a brain that is so full of ideas and is so excited to explore all of them all at once. And, and you don't want to say no to any of the shiny possibilities. And, and so we chronically overschedule ourselves because we don't want to miss the chance for something amazing. And then if you happen to also be a, a people pleaser or a caretaker in any way, it's really hard to say no uh, as well. And also highly interested in curious brains tend to also collect physical clutter because we want to like keep the shiny cool things and so our physical spaces get cluttered our mental spaces get cluttered our lives get cluttered and it is super easy to accidentally prioritize in your days the things that are less important to you and deprioritize the things that are more important to you start with is figure out what your actual priorities are. I read a little tip that somebody told me today that they have three lists. One of them is the things I actually have to do. One of them is the things I want to do. And the third one, the least important one, is the things other people want me to do. So where does it all go wrong? What are some of the common errors people make when trying to fit their creative endeavors, like writing and world building, into this full busy life that we have that is, you know, full of ideas and, and everything else? One of the things is just scheduling your creative space at the very edges of your life. Like you put mm -hmm. all the other stuff gets to take up space in the middle and you slide your creative work out into whatever slivers of time you have left. If you want your creative work to be the core of your life, it should get to take up some of the space in the middle. That's the same problem you have when you're reorganizing a room. If you're stuck in the ways that it has been done, you don't see what else is possible. Let's look at physical space. Let's look at the way you're handling your calendar. Be willing to let go of a working system in order to have a better system. I think that that sort of anxiety traps us very often. So maybe that's one of the core problems is the anxiety of, will I wreck everything? Yeah. Not letting us move forward. I thought it was very interesting what you said about people pleasing as well. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. I think it is valuable to separate out the behavior of people pleasing from a, a caretaker tendency. The caretaker tendency is healthy and important and part of a of healthy relationships. You need to tend to the relationships in your life. However, people pleasing for me is when that goes to the point where you are giving away everything that matters to you because you would rather make other people happy than make them upset. You have to be willing to be inconvenient to the people around you. You are allowed to take up space and be inconvenient and your creative work gets to be inconvenient both for you and for other people because it's important enough to give it that space and so when you recognize that people pleasing tendency learning how to set limits on how much of yourself you are willing to give away and then you make conscious decisions i think another thing that can potentially hold people back is it's not just fear of failure it's fear of success absolutely we actually have in our brains a whole limbic system that's entire job is to protect us from harm that fear of success that fear of failure is the limbic brain wants to keep you from doing the scary thing doing the, the risky thing because succeeding might harm you the minute you succeed you are open to criticism the minute you are visible you are a target. And then there's this hugely self-protective imp impulse to, to draw back. Just like in a relationship, you cannot have a, a close relationship with a person unless you're willing to be vulnerable and let that person hurt you. And that's same with our creative work. Unless we are willing to let the results of the work potentially hurt us, 
we can't put our hearts into actually doing the work and getting it out there. I think that is a very deep and pertinent statement. Um, so your actual pitched topic for this podcast was your access needs, adapting your life to fit your capacity. Can you give us an overview of what you mean by this? Absolutely. Access is a term that's often used in disability community and disability discussions where you're talking about how does somebody get to the things that they need. Capacity is a term borrowed from electrical you know circuits and stuff you know what what how much can you hold how much can you let flow through you before you are drained dry so capacity of a battery is how much how much battery life do you have left and we all have different limits our, our limits are variable you know one day i can answer all the emails and you know, write all the like three blog posts and do the dishes and drive my kids everywhere and, and, and. And then the next day, probably because I overtaxed the first day, I am a jellyfish and I drift around my house feeling like I ought to be doing something useful. And I'm not, I just can't even figure out what it is. None of our lives are static, you know? We saw this writ large with the pandemic where everybody suddenly, like all of the creative people I know, we got six months in and everybody was like, I cannot write. I don't even understand. I can barely read what is going on. Like on the surface, my life hadn't changed very much. I still pretty much stayed home. And yeah, sure, some shelves are empty at the grocery store and there's these weird stickers on the floor that I have to follow and everybody's masked. But like that seems so small, but it was all of the mental calculations. Life changed and we all had to figure out how to adapt to that. And individual lives change. You know, you get married, you get divorced, you have a child, your child goes to college, you get a diagnosis for a mental health issue, or you get a diagnosis for a physical health issue. All of these things require you to adapt to whatever the new capacity is. And that step one to adapting to an adjusted capacity is recognizing that your capacity has changed and processing the emotional grief that goes along with that. We talked about success being scary. Success also often has a grief component in it. Any big emotional change requires you to process it in ways that are similar to grief processing. What do we mean by capacity specifically when we're talking about creative work? Excellent question. Let's talk about creativity. If you think of a creativity as the aquifer, the yeah. creative well, you can drive a well down into an aquifer and you pull water up, but you have to have that underground reservoir of energy, of, of ideas, of things. And there are things that you can do to refill and replenish your aquifer and there are things that you do that draw upon it and drain it. In this context, I would say that capacity is the flow rate that you can draw out and the flow rate that you can put things in. There are lots of things in our lives that draw upon our creative aquifer that we don't usually think of as creative. Let's do this overbroad view. What is going on in your life that is using your creative capacity? If you're doing caregiving work for an aging parent or a child that you're raising, or a friend in need, that's hugely creative. So these things all draw upon that creative capacity that you have. It's also useful to acknowledge that some forms of creative work actually make us more energized when we're done than when we started. You know, for me, writing often does that. It becomes this respite, this, when I emerge from writing, yes, I am tired, but my well is also fuller. So recognizing and learning, okay, which of the things, even though they make me tired, feed into the well? And which things are just pure drain? And do I allow that drain because it accomplishes something else that's the priority of mine? Like, I let my day job drain me because I like paying my bills. And right now, that's the only way to do that. So, you know, day job gets to be a drain. I think that's you. that's what is so easy for us to forget sometimes. You know, when we come to the computer, we come to the, the notebook and we think, well, where is the creativity? Like, I haven't done any creativity in a while. There should be inspiration in there. But, you know, you've been caring for your aged mother and you've just moved house. So all of your routines are gone. And, 
then you discover that actually you've used up all of the juice in the well, essentially. It's not the drain rate that's the problem. It's the refresh rate. It's how do you get energy? So if on a regular basis, the pattern is I am too drained to do my creative work. Is there some practice or something I could institute a small 15 minute focused re-energizing recharge thing where I can like do that super, I plugged my phone into the supercharger and now I've got 50%. I had 10 and now I've got 50 and 50 is not great, but it's enough to get started. What can you do that will actually refresh versus the thing your impulse tells you to do, which is you know, the binge watch or the mindless gameplay because you just want to rest. And those things do potentially recharge and allow rest, but they often don't do that fast recharge. Obviously, everybody is different, but what are some of the things that we can try to recharge ourselves or, you know, supercharge ourselves if we're feeling drained? I've seen people do power naps, take a nap 20 minutes, and you can teach your body and brain to do that so that you've basically (laughs) rebooted. I've heard people talk about going for a walk. I'm going to glance at my work in progress. I'm now going to go for a 15 minute walk and let my brain ruminate over the things that I glanced at. I've seen rituals around, I am going to get my special beverage and then the smell and the somatic of the the hot beverage and the, the ritual of making it sometimes helps put you back into the space. Um, One of the things that I've discovered for me is that if when I'm taking breaks, I read instead of watch, it can be a digital book, but if I'm reading a book rather than reading snippets on social media, that puts my brain more into a writing space. I am more able to write in the evening if I've been reading books at 10 a.m. How can we try to start restructuring our own lives at least? a little tiny bit today. Okay. One, take a look at your physical space. Is there something in your physical space that you can do to make it easier to get into your work zone? You know, can you literally clear the path to your chair? Can you pre-plan, think about like Airbnb owners and how they want to create an inviting space. What can you do to create an inviting space for your future self? to just walk up to and sit down in. And so that's tip one, physical space, make a small improvement. Tip two, what's your mental load? Take a look at all of the things you are carrying in your head and maybe sit down either with a person you can talk to if you're a verbal processor or writing if you're a written processor and brain dump all of the things that you are carrying in your head. Take 15, 20 minutes, or less, depending on how to just write about all of the stupid stuff that you have going on that you need to get done and dump it all onto the page. The third thing is a little bit bigger, but it is to say out loud that grief is a creative process. Grief is the process by which you break down what was and find the pieces of what will come next. And so, yeah. (laughs) Sandra, you got to make me cry on stream. So sorry. But also you need to know this, you need to know this. And if you have any kind of a grief process going on in your life, take a moment to acknowledge it to yourself, maybe in that brain dump post and give yourself permission to feel the thing that's grieving you and and give yourself some time. And then you can pick up and move on with your day. And, And griefs are not always big, I mean, During the pandemic, I saw so many people grieving the haircuts they couldn't get. You know, we grieve all kinds of little stuff. So anyway, so that's the the third. Yeah, that is wonderful. Thank you, Sandra. So those are some quick, easy things. Obviously, in your book, you go you go a lot deeper. What else can we find in your book, Structuring Life to Support Creativity? So one of the chapters I'm going to be writing is The Weight of the World. How do you keep creating when your brain is freaking out over climate change or politics or, you know, all of these things. Also, how do you believe in your own work when, you know, you could quietly stop creating and no one would notice? I have a whole really cool section on motivation and stopping and starting. So these are some of the things. 
the backer kit page, which is still up and visible, does have a, a full table of contents. Wow.